Thank you very much, Professor Lang, for your introductions. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here this evening to listen to my lecture. The title of my lecture comes from a line in Alexander Pope's essay on criticism, for fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Pope's essay is a poem mostly concerned with how writers and literary critics should behave in the 1700s, and in particular on how to write poetry. The particular quote I use comes from the third stanza in the poem, and it discusses the moral qualities and virtues inherent in the ideal critic, who Pope claims is also the ideal man. The inference in the stanza, um, it's sort of old English, so I'm not going to read it out, is that people act very cautiously to begin with, and then they rush out boldly. These fools then carry on without restraint, whereas others would be more guarded. Now, I believe that nurses are not fools, but they do go where angels fear to tread. They have taken a path into higher education that is challenging, and in their practice, they experience profound emotional connections with patients and carers that many other professions do not. The phrase, where angels fear to tread, is also being used by others. It was used by Edmund Burke in his classic reflections on revolution in France. It was quoted by Abraham Lincoln in, when he was arguing <coughs> against slavery in Praoria. And it's also a very famous novel by E.M. Forster. Look what august company we're keeping this evening. It's also a popular song by Frank Sinatra, which I'm not going to sing for you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. The symbol of the angel is often used as a metaphorical representation for the caring actions of nurses. And the quote suggests that nurses as angels go even further when they care for patients. They go into sensitive, interpersonal territory that's often untangible, intangible, and unseen, but felt. They risk going where even angels may fear to tread, as in Harry's story, he said, I tried to put it together. I started with getting flu, and I remember the ambulance, then it goes into strangeness. Voices, snatches of things. I can't tell anyone about the worst things, I just can't. Then her face, bright and big as the moon, coming down from the sky to hover over me. Cecilia, really the loveliest face, pulling me up from dark water. Nurse Cecilia. I see you, she said to me. This is where you are. I see you holding me safe in her eyes. Therefore, the image of an angel seemed appropriate for my lecture, as well as the idea that nurses never turn aside. And there are other reasons too, and I will reveal these as the lecture progresses. This is going to be a lecture of two halves. I'll begin by discussing the place of nursing as a discipline situated in higher education. I'd like to explain why I believe our profession has a place in an academic environment and how I have contributed to its evolution. And at times it's been hard, but I promise you it's been worth it. One constituent of the philosophical, theoretical and evidence-based practice of nursing has been the literature on caring as a fundamental aspect of nursing. Recently, there's been much focus in the media on nurses' lack of caring and in a sad and gravely flawed situation in mid-Staffordshire. We can't close our eyes to these shocking revelations or any other reports of lack of care, compassion, and respect for people who place themselves when in a very vulnerable state into our hands. I've studied the concept of caring and how this phenomenon can be interpreted, always with the intention of gaining a better understanding to improve the care that we give to patients through the education and practice. It's been a principle of mine to ensure that caring has been part of nursing curriculum. And when I think back, this started when I first began nursing and developed through my interest in the human condition, social psychology, and my PhD research. And this will be the focus of the second half of my lecture. First of all, Professions. A profession is a vocation, usually founded upon specialised educational training, typically regulated by statute and enforced by professional bodies, such as in my case, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. 
Professionals exercise professional judgment based upon a unique body of knowledge. This knowledge is transmitted to those who wish to enter the profession and is often incorporated into a form of internship or practice experience. This may be associated with academic achievements or recognized in a professional accreditation. Because professionals have undergone prolonged specialized training, they have gained a collectivity of knowledge and have a strong service orientation where the well-being of the patient is the, of primary importance. This gives rise to a vocational subculture and codes of behaviour. Because professionals have undertaken prolonged specialised training, they have developed ethical codes and frameworks to be able to justify their decisions and exercise accountability for those decisions. Health professionals are generally held in high esteem by the public and because they have specialist knowledge can achieve a certain level of power and status and this enables them to gain credibility in organisations. Professional bodies and representational groups further the interests of those professions and in many cases support the development of a professional knowledge. Let's look at an academic discipline. An academic discipline is a knowledge domain. It's associated with an academic field of study. It's taught and researched in universities, for example, the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The structural framework and organization of academic institutions usually determines what constitutes the boundaries of that knowledge domain. These structures, and within them academic communities, are thought to influence the distinctions and make people aware of the differences between different disciplines, for example, physics and chemistry, or the interdisciplinary fields, for example, women's studies and social sciences. Now, the identity of an academic community depends upon arguers and inquirers and critics that constitute a critical mass to develop sustainable research programs. They engage in interdisciplinary collaboration and curricula that meet the current societal needs. And interestingly, the Latin derivation of the word discipline is in given instruction to learners. But academic disciplines are subject to historical and geographical and cultural variations over time. And the dynamic nature of knowledge development will have an impact on that discipline. Whilst the professions in the healthcare sector are responsive to NHS reforms and policies, so too are academic departments subject to the changing landscapes. Higher education and societal demands can influence a the discipline. Therefore, for an academic discipline to maintain its identity, it's essential to retain a continuity of the distinctive features from within the origins of that discipline. And so it's argued that it's essential for an academic discipline to have these features. Now, I believe nursing knowledge in higher education has all of these features. The dilemma, however, for nursing is how it can fulfill an academic discipline and be a member of a profession at the same time. There's a constant vacillation between the values of the academic discipline and the pursuit of knowledge and the role of the professional. Nursing can be said to have an external face that the public see as the epitome of the caring angel. Who is well, is efficient, reliable, and effective. The other face is the internal knowledge required to maintain the public face. Early in nursing's history, the intellectual dimensions of nursing knowledge were implicit. This was acquired through an apprenticeship model and supplied through pearls of wisdom often dispensed by other professionals. And by the middle of the 20th century, it emerged that complex and effective nursing was, a ch was, meeting, was not meeting the changing society's need. Nursing required the integrated knowledge of several disciplines, such as physiology, sociology, and psychology. Society wanted more than someone who could undertake basic technical aspects of nursing, even though these are essential. Nursing began to question and explore the philosophical base of care, developing theoretical frameworks and nursing-focused research. Consequently, nursing knowledge developed to embrace both professional practice and the academic nature of nursing and the notion of a degree-prepared nursing profession emerged to bring it in line with other similar professions. 
Through my work with the Royal College of Nursing as chair of the National Education Forum, I lobbied politicians from all parties, and I worked to gain an acceptance of a universal degree preparation for nursing. Not wanting to stop there, I found a way to influence the new degree programs, and this was to create a series of textbooks meeting the needs of the new degree nursing students. So since 2009, I have created and edited 36 books now on the Transforming Nursing series, and 75% of these have been adopted as core nursing texts in the United Kingdom. Professional values center on vocational service to others whereas academic values are, independent, are underpinned by inquiry, abstract ideas that lead to new knowledge. And this is developed through theory testing or empirical research. Now, traditionally, nursing has not been associated with this approach. It's about focusing on caring for individuals. It's about families and communities. And nursing aims to attain min maximum optimal health and quality of life. The goal is to ensure that patients don't suffer. And it's interesting to note here that the Latin derivation of the word patient is to suffer. Whereas universities were traditionally centers for developing theoretical knowledge, with the development of professional knowledge, the concept of the professional discipline has emerged. And professional areas of practice and applied sciences, such as health sciences, which includes nursing and midwifery, and a, a wide range of other clinical specialties and therapeutic modes, have been included alongside the structures of traditional academic disciplines and creating this notion of a professional discipline. Now, the aim of the academic discipline is to know through debate, description, analysis, and research. And it may be theoretical, basic, or applied. In contrast, the concept of a professional discipline, rather than an academic discipline, has evolved. A discipline that's both descriptive and prescriptive in theories which characterize the implementation of practical knowledge. We've explored clinical and life world research, and this has been developed to utilize both deductive and inductive reasoning. And again, it's a challenge to those angels who, for the traditional methods of inquiry that they have been using, and in settings that are equally challenging to study. For nursing to claim to be a professional discipline, we have to resolve the ambiguity or tug of values between the concrete and the abstract service and scholarship theory and practice. The positioning of nursing education in universities is added to this dilemma. In the UK, although originally proposed in the 1920s in the USA, which began to establish schools of nursing, the first university department of nursing was established in Edinburgh in 1972. With the dramatic growth thereafter in Manchester, Cardiff, London, Hull, and Glasgow. Now, Brighton was up there with the rest of them. They established their first nursing degree in 1982, having already established community nursing and health visiting courses. The gradual migration of nursing education into higher education began in the 1990s, and that came with the major shift of diploma programs from hospital-based schools of nursing into education, in higher education, and with the Nursing and Midwifery Council decision in 2008 to have all nurses prepared at degree level by 2013, this year. So it took a little while, but we got there in the end. Now, on the one hand, this has strengthened the opportunities for the intellectual and academic development of nursing knowledge, as well as the opportunity to publish research and theoretical papers. Theories with high levels of abstraction have been developed and unified concepts and theories. And I'm going to explore more of that theoretical development in the second half of the lecture. On the other hand, we're caught up in the need to focus equally on research and teaching. While nursing has traditionally focused on teaching, we have to try and maintain the balance between theoretical knowledge and practice. We have little funding or sustained capacity building in the UK to develop research communities. We do have a growing body of evidence to underpin practice. And the predicament here is if attention is diverted to research, the development of practice will suffer. Whereas many believe it should remain the focus of nursing academic work. So the challenge is to combine teaching, research, and practice. And this is another example of nurses going where angels fear to tread. 
Newman, in his 19th century classic, The Idea of a University, claimed that the fundamental role of a university is to teach students to think. The notion of a university being a Newtonian learning experience is somewhat compromised for learning students, as it is affected by the expectations of a healthcare system, and that demands responsiveness, short-term outputs, and this is achieved through training rather than education. Yet, Faridi, in 2004, claimed that in higher education, a classic intellectual, a person with genuine learning, breadth of vision, and a concern for public issues is an endangered species. And this implies that universities face a similar challenge. The higher education sector in the UK has grown and become more accessible in the 21st century. And this is despite changes in funding. Whilst the number of students in nursing in higher education fluctuates in association with NHS workforce plans, we find academic disciplines and professionals all making transitions as public expectations with higher education increases. Traditional academic subjects are expected to produce employable <coughs> graduates. No longer can knowledge be pursued only for knowledge's sake. And there are even higher expectations of our graduate nurses, some of whom are here this evening. Now, I hope that this discussion is pointing out not only the differences between an academic discipline and the development of professional knowledge, but also shaping the idea that there are similarities. Both are adapting to a changing world. Both are seeking to sustain fundamental elements of either academic discourse or practical knowledge, and both are based on a set of values. Where the major difference lies, I believe, is in the ability to openly critique without impunity. When the professions do critique organizations and systems, we have very disturbing revelations, such as those reported in the Francis inquiries. Nursing knowledge. Over the past 30 years, there have been several nursing theorists who have published accounts of nursing knowledge. And nursing theory underpins nursing knowledge and often gets a very bad press. It's not perceived as realistic, and it's far too abstract to be applied. Yet it is very often derived from practice, and it's not the product of blue sky thinking of an academic gazing out of their study window. It's purposeful, it's thought provoking, and it can be a means to understand the intricacies of nursing and how it can be developed. This is at both an individual, family, or community level. Increasingly, nursing is required to produce evidence for practice, and that has to be if about effectiveness. And the evidence is on clinical outcomes for patient benefit. So we need more nurses to not just to nurse, but to make up clinical academic careers, combining research with clinical roles. Nurses need to be competent and skillful. They also need to think, be knowledgeable, and problem solve. And that's what 20th century nursing demands. So I said I was going to tell you a little bit more about these angels. And before I move to the second part of my lecture, I'd like you to give you the second reason for selecting the angel as my image. The angel, as some of you may know, is also a statue that marks the boundaries between Brighton and Ho. It's on the seafront. Some of you might have seen it there. And it's a local landmark. And I thought it would be fitting, therefore, to include it in a professorial inaugural lecture for the University of Brighton with apologies to Eastbourne and Hastings, <laughs> where we also have many students. And it's known as the Peace Statue. So I'm now going to look at caring and compassion. Out of the development of nursing knowledge and theory in the 1970s and 80s, there emerged several fundamental nursing concepts, and caring was one such concept not surprisingly. It was deemed a universal phenomenon, and it influences the way we think, feel, and behave, and it's been studied from a variety of philosophical and ethical perspectives. A range of theories have also been developed with caring as a dominant concept. My first introduction to the literature on caring was a little book, it's really only very small, tucked away in the postgraduate library in the Brighton General Hospital. I don't know if you remember some of you that library with Judy Learman ministering over us. And from my, I was picking up the pieces of my nursing degree which I'd started already whilst I was working in the USA. 
And from my experiences there, I witnessed the detailed and knowledgeable care given by graduate nurses. I started then on my own academic path and the conviction that all nurses should be graduates, knowing that caring had to be an essential ingredient. Now, according to Mayorov, caring requires knowing. And he says, we sometimes speak as if caring did not require knowledge, as if caring for someone, for example, were simply a matter of good intentions or warm regard. But in order to care, I must understand others' needs, and I must be able to respond properly to them. And clearly, good intentions do not guarantee this. An inaugural conference in Utah back in the 1970s, stimulated by the seminal work of Madeleine Leininger, set out the guidelines for the systematic study and exploration of the phenomenon of caring. The result has been a diverse and substantive body of research, including a wide range of foci. Curiously, in Florence Nightingale's well-known notes on nursing, caring was not explicit. Shocked, aren't we? Yet, nursing is described as a caring practice. Now, what caring practice means has been the subject of many nursing studies. And in a period from 1975 to 2008, there have been incrementally over 1,000 publications. These studies include a variety of research methods and philosophical analysis. The publications provide many definitions of caring, which makes it a complex subject to teach or even measure. And my own work has been to critique these studies in conjunction with colleagues from across Europe. This has refreshed and renewed perspectives for what we believe to be a changing, multicultural, European context of caring in health settings. All the studies have agreed that caring is an integral component of the relationship nurses, health professionals and those concerned with the well-being of others have with those in their care. There remains, though, no agreed definition of caring and controversy surrounds its measurement. And I'd like to explore why this might be the case. Why is it that something that should be so obvious seems so complicated? So over time, there's been considerable theoretical development and research activity to develop the discipline of caring knowledge and establish a field of caring science. Now, caring science is an autonomous science that's not tied to one profession or another with an epistemological root in the human sciences. It emphasizes the patient's world and constitutes a knowledge base for all professions within the caring and helping disciplines. Leininger, Watson, and Morse, here's the theory bit, by the way, were the forerunners in North America to refine conceptual understanding in the caring science field. Leininger's theory of transcultural care proposed that human beings are inseparable from their cultural background, their social structures, histories, and environments. Her work included studies of different cultural perspectives on the concept of caring, and she concluded that caring is expressed in different ways in many different cultures. Watson's transpersonal theory of caring reminds us that the word caring is derived from the Greek word caritas, which means to cherish, to appreciate, and to give special consideration. And the theory places emphasis on the interpersonal relationship aspects of caring and considers the potential of the existential position of relationships between nurses and patients in intensely close encounters. The proposition that caring involves sensitivity, respect, and high moral ethical commitment are encased in her work. And she's identified 10 carative factors and claimed that the caring process is a deliberate choice, which not everyone chooses. Similarly, theorists Boykin and Schoenfer, theory of nursing as caring, define caring as being honest, connecting with patients, entering into their worlds, and being in the moment. And this more existential theory is, describes it as a presencing, as being with patients in every sense. Morse undertook a detailed analysis of the concept of comfort in caring and identified these five areas. Caring science has developed predominantly in North America, and the view of caring evolved from there has been critiqued by myself and others as not being universally acceptable. And European theorists have been writing their own humanistic and historical perspectives. In Sweden, Ericsson has developed a model of humanistic thinking in caring science. The premise of this theory is that caring leads to suffering, 
that, sorry, that lack of caring leads to suffering. <laughs> and this is a violation of human dignity. Martinson has been very influential in Norway and Denmark since her critique of nursing that addressed nursing's historical responsibility for the vulnerable. And her contention is that care is to be concrete and present in a relationship by our senses and our bodies. It's always to be in a movement away from ourselves and towards the other. Yet these theories are not seen as adequate to serve the needs of a constantly changing society, and my recent work has been to set up a European Academy of Caring Science. The aim is to develop a greater understanding of the transcultural nature of caring or religious mores and perceptions, which are sometimes contested. We are exploring the life world domains of the context of caring and the implications of the public health communities. The Academy is an interprofessional network that crosses health and social care domains. Since being established in 2007, we've held annual symposium to encourage new researchers in their PhD studies where there would not have been an opportunity before. And this forges understanding between the new generations of researchers and research in the future. It seems so obvious, and yet you can begin to see why it's been so difficult to define the concept when there are many interpretations and perceptions of what caring is. And Swanson has even described this in modern day nursing as a tower of Babel. But here is Benner and Rubel's definition from their work on primacy of caring. They go on to say that caring is a word for being connected and having things matter works well because it fuses thought, feeling and action, knowing and being. And the term caring is used appropriately to describe a wide range of involvements from romantic love to parental love to friendship, from caring for one's garden to caring about one's work to caring for and about one's patients. There can also be a distinction made between caring for and caring about. The former process of caring is, is one of a process approach, whilst the latter is having a more emotional connection with another person. And in nursing, these two factors are brought together in the forefront of whatever we do. The depth and meaning of these relationships, which are also sometimes with relatives, carers associated with patients, are the result of varying degrees of intimate connectedness at times in people's lives when they may be at their most vulnerable. A yearning or need to care is also described as the calling or vocational attributes that brings people into nursing. The values of nursing provide a sense of purpose and ethic that attract and sustain nurses in the work that they do. However, it's not only nurses who want to care. Many people want to make a difference and seek a unique sense of personal satisfaction in that caring for someone else can bring. Others see caring as a value that's inherent in all human beings and in particular women. From a feminist perspective, caring is viewed as women's work and has become part of nursing rather than caring being part of nursing. However, approximately 10% of nurses are male, and a study of male nursing students in 2008 found that the caring behaviour of female students were used as the benchmark for assessing male caring. Now, the male students were frustrated by this because they couldn't get into those situations that the females were in, so therefore they couldn't demonstrate that they were caring, whereas in fact they really wanted to care as much as females. Well, male or female, we can all care for someone at some point in our lives. In some cases, family members or even neighbours are designated as carers, and therefore caring is definitely not unique to nurses. So in my view, caring is an inherent human trait, demonstrated by some more than others, and is situation dependent. Now this brings me on to thinking about compassion. Compassion is a strong emotion. It's considered to be a sentiment stimulated by the presence of suffering that evokes recognition and mutual sharing of the despair or suffering of the sufferer's plight. And rather than being an expression of the caregiver's sorrow, as in sympathy, the compassionate carer echoes the sentiments of the sufferer and shares the suffering. In sharing the other's suffering, the caregiver expresses compassion and that strengthens and comforts the sufferers. 
To identify what is different about caring in nursing, the theorist Roach asks, well, what is a nurse actually doing when she or he is caring? And her study of nursing describes six attributes, known as the six Cs, and she was the first nursing theorist to identify compassion as a component. Now, you will be pleased to know that without replicating the whole literature review on caring of 600 articles, the six Cs have been examined with a great deal of detail. Rating scales to measure caring behaviours from a patient's and student's perspective, from nursing education on how caring is taught, as well as theoretical papers. So in, care, in, in summary, caring is attributable to most human societies and considered fundamental to healthcare professions. In nursing, it's an expectation that we will dis, dis demonstrate all the caring and compassionate attributes. And the depth and level to which we attend that caring dimension continues to be the subject of debate, research, theoretical study, and much media attention. Lately, caring and compassion have become buzzwords. The reports on Winterburn View Care Home in Gloucestershire and Mid Staffordshire Hospital have shocked us to the core. The Chief Nothing Officer for England, Jane Cummins, recently in December 2012, set out her vision for nursing, entitled Compassion in Nursing, Midwives and, and Caregivers, Our Vision for the Future. This focuses on her six Cs, care, compassion, competence, communication, courage and commitment, not quite the same as Roach's. And these values are to form a part of the change management programme to be taken throughout all the areas of the NHS. And it's agreed that this vision to become a reality, all caring staff need to be part of a supporting organisation. And there's an acknowledgement in the policy that staff need time to reflect, to build emotional resilience, and that leadership is key. There's a recognition that the NHS culture has to change. And here is the sting in the tail. All action areas for achieving the six Cs will be within current budgets. No additional funding to support those changes. And there have been other reports previously that have tackled the perceptions and expectations of nursing and midwifery in the second millennium. In 2010, the Prime Minister's Commission on the Future of Nursing and Midwifery in England published Frontline Care. The Commission looked at nursing and midwifery today in the current context of the socio-economic health and demographic trends that we experience, and it dispelled some myths and misunderstandings. Above all, they highlighted the mistaken idea that compassion cannot be separated from competent nurses. You can have competence without <coughs> compassion, but compassion is essential if you have to have competent nurses. So compassion is vital, but alone it's not enough. And the Commission found that nurses needed to be compassionate and competent to deliver safe care. Focusing on these things alone is not enough. In November 2012, the Nursing Care Quality Forum made recommendations to the current Prime Minister, and they suggested improving the quality of nursing care. Many are in the government's current response to the Health Commission and the Francis Report, and these detail the appalling care given to nurses and health care by nurses and healthcare professionals in Mid Staffordshire. We know that the care was inexcusable, and we also know that the already depleted nursing establishment was being cut in preparation for an application for foundation trust status. The main recommendations of the NCQF are again, investment in leadership, time to care, with support for a graduate nursing workforce. And in my view, it's the conditions of caring that need attention. As a reminder, we're talking about a large body of people here. There are over 600,000 registered nurses and midwives in England, 90% of them women, plus an unknown and growing number of healthcare support staff. Nursing and midwifery account for a large share of public spending, including 13 billion spent in 2009 on NHS pay and pre-registration education alone. With over 20,600 nursing education places commissioned in 2009, for example, we're probably the largest student body in England. And we're more popular than a few years ago as a career choice, but we're now competing for very able candidates who have many other choices. 
So what else do we need to consider to bring about this refocusing of caring and compassion in nursing? With all these people and all this public money, there's an increasing evidence in the conditions in which nursing takes place, strongly affecting nursing care. And this is just not about physical environment and poor workplaces. The conditions for caring will always be challenging. Human suffering is hard to countenance. The social and technical worlds that surround suffering in today's healthcare settings are varied and complex, whether in someone's home or an acute ward. Caring for patients in a day case surgical ward may be more technically focused due to the time constraints, whereas caring for long-term conditions may not have the same pressures. The staffing mix on wards could be another factor, and the ratio of patients to qualified and qualified nursing is also crucial. And there are studies that indicate poor care outcomes are associated with low staffing levels, but that's not all the story. There is a concern that nursing is losing its essence of caring, with procedures and technology taking over precedence over care. And Wilkinson, in 2007, describes it as an institutionalized heartlessness that ignores the needs of patients and encourages others to think that this is acceptable. A lack of conscience and kindness and a sense of duty to others are missing. And investigations into NHS hospitals where patients have suffered very poor care have all found remote and inaccessible managers who refused to listen to staff and would not involve them in decisions. Low staff morale, fatalism among clinicians are some of the things that have been reported and a reluctance to raise concerns. <coughs> and the Care Quality Commission in 2011 stated that care often seemed to be broken down into tasks to be completed, focusing on the unit of work rather than the person. And the indications are that we have to look at all the factors that affect the conditions as well as the capabilities of nurses to care. And Swanson has indicated that these are the areas that we need to focus on. Papa Stavrou, in 2011, in a systematic review of caring literature, found that there was little congruence between nurses and patients' perceptions of caring. We have to think about this. The increasing emphasis on patient outcomes means that nurses can no longer continue to describe what caring compassion is or what it means. They believe that it's essential for nurses to revisit caring and compassion as a central focus, to demonstrate that it makes a difference to patient well-being and health, but too late. The reports are indicating just that. Now, I'm going to turn to another factor that I think influences the differences between nursing and the between patients and nurses. Expectations are linked to perceptions, and the expectations of caring are featured in several papers on caring. And a recent discussion focuses on the influence of generational characteristics. The current population of nurses comprises four different generations. So too are the patients. We have four different generational areas. The silent generation is described as hardworking conformists who find it difficult to question younger generations who believe in having a life outside work and having fun. In settings where many patients are over 70 years, they may find it hard to communicate with younger generations who expect them to speak up and question their own care. The baby boomers are thought to comprise 48% of the current healthcare workforce, and they're conscientious, it's thought, and hardworking, and do not agree with the values of Generation X or Y, but disagree with the managerial culture of institutions and challenge hierarchies, whereas the silent generation accepts all of this. Generation X is heavily influenced by television, single parenting and cohabiting, computers and the societal consequences of HIV AIDS. And they're more technologically savvy than the previous generations, but not as quick as Generation Y. They're job focused during work hours, but lack loyalty to an organization and they tend to be cynical, it's thought, and individualistic. Generation Y, on the other hand, also known as the millennials and or, or the net generation, are defined by the internet, TV reality shows, multiculturalism and diversity. They will be loyal to their jobs and they like opportunities and variety. They will be armed with the internet information, probably bringing their applications in with them to check out and question the care that's being given. 
Now, this can be perceived as questioning authority and undermining by older generations. And the generational differences, therefore, and the perceptions and the expectations are factors that are worth considering. Or is it that care is becoming invisible? Corbyn suggests that caring is not a lost art, but it's at odds with the many conditions under which nurses are working today. And this assumption is based on a review of the literature that's seen almost a revolutionary change in technology, political factors, pharmacology, economic factors, science, and nursing changes. In a study by Maven of student nurses um, in 26, but it's uh, more uh, information has come out from that study since that time, she looked at student nurses to see how they would like to care for patients. And she followed those student nurses up four to six months and 11 to 15 months later. And they spoke of those nurses that they saw. And they saw that, said that they didn't want to emulate them. They saw nurses who considered nursing just a job, who were not good care role models. They gave examples of ways they tried to make a difference. And over 70% of those nurses, once they become qualified, described how this, under, this work that they tried to do was undermined, undervalued, and not valued in, compared to tasks. Mabin uncovered a set of covert rules, together with overwhelming organizational constraints, which was relentlessly hampered by changes in the constitutions. These unwritten rules included hurried physical care, don't get involved with the patients. Fit in. Don't try and change practice. The organizational constraints were increased turnover of patients, uh, work overload, time pressures because of staff shortages or poor skill mix. And the root result was routinized, routinized and task orientated care. This results in a lack of acknowledgement of caring skills, such as the interpersonal aspects. And a participant in the study expected as, expressed it as this. Much of what we do as nurses cannot easily be measured. For instance, sitting with a patient at 3 o'clock in the morning who's afraid to switch off the light and close their eyes in case they never open them again, how can that experience be benchmarked? The prevalent discourse in healthcare is management-led, and in a bid to drive up improvements and quality, it's subject to monthly measurement targets, monthly measurement targets, so much so that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Measuring and quality management is fundamental to improving patient care. However, it's counterproductive if it's damaging opportunities for nurses to care. Consequently, the art and science of caring has become marginalized and subordinated. Alternative research has found that nurses care too much and have a tendency to become over-involved with patients, will visit patients on their days off because they want to compensate for the care that they couldn't give whilst they were on duty. So we have to consider then the extent to which nurses expend emotional labour into their caring work, and I don't think this can be underestimated. Emotional labour is a concept that recognises both the huge emotional effort and the human frailty of nurses during those encounters with the people for whom they care. And this is not exclusive to nurses. And it has resonance with many, many other healthcare professionals. It has been recognised in nursing as being part of almost every patient care encounter. And there's a story here which I think describes that. She said... There's only a curtain between each bed, but each time a nurse goes behind that curtain, she interacts in a different way with the individual needs of that person. She does that all the time, all day, and sounds as if each interaction is as meaningful as the one before. How do they do it? Experiencing emotions is a fundamental human trait. Yet nurses are expected to cope with morally difficult clinical situations, for example, patients who refuse treatment or advice, and to interact ethically and meaningfully with people in distress from all occupations and backgrounds. The concept of emotional dif labor differentiates between ideal emotions and thoughts that nurses should theoretically feel and those that they actually experience but cannot express. In some nurses may be experiencing contradictory emotions, or dealing with their own emotions about a situation, which they cannot express 
because they must maintain a professional caring and compassionate approach to patients in their care. Nurses are aware of the personal costs to catch, attached to their caring, but they don't always recognise the professional and personal costs of their emotional labour. There are publications regarding nurses' awareness of emotional labour which suggest that this effort is not highly valued. Nurses' emotional exhaustion has been shown to result in depersonalisation of patients and the fact that emotional labour is not acknowledged and undervalued by the majority of healthcare organisations may contribute to the understanding of the empirical link between emotional labour, emotional exhaustion and professional burnout in nurses. Now this is definitely nurses who rush in, but even angels fear to tread. In conclusion, I have brought the two halves to make a whole, because I think we know, even though I have talked today to you about harrowing reports of a lack of caring in nursing, we know that compassion and caring are embedded in nursing. We know how to teach it, and we do this through a very finely balanced combination of academic and practical work. Furthermore, I maintain that nursing has a place in academia as a professional discipline. We theorise, we research, we share this in our teaching and in collaboration with our practice colleagues. I'd like now to offer my thanks. On occasions like this, it's important to thank those who have in some way or another visibly or invisibly played a significant part in this inaugural lecture. And in doing so, I may forget someone, and if I have, please forgive me. I'd like to thank, first of all, Katie Warriner and her team who've been helping me set this event up and to the AV staff who've helped me with it. To my colleagues in the Faculty of Health and Social Sciences and the Dean David Taylor, my two fellow heads of school, and my colleagues in the School of Nursing and Midwifery, past and present, I extend my thanks for your support and loyalty. To my past colleagues, associates and partners in crime, you all know who you are, who have in their own ways contributed to my being here today, working with me, checking drafts and responding to my ideas, thank you. I'd like to particularly thank Dr. Ricky Lucock, my PhD supervisor, who sadly cannot be here today, who helped me understand the wonders of the philosophy of science. Professor Bryn Davis, who introduced me to social psychology. To my friends and colleagues at the Royal College of Nursing, who believe so passionately in nursing and nursing education. To Dame Betty Kershaw, who introduced me to the publishers, Less Learning Matters, and to Becky Taylor, who's the editor who has helped work with me to make the Transforming Nursing series such a success. Many thanks also to my friends, to my book group pals, who have given me the opportunity to read something else over the last 20 years except nursing literature. And lastly, thanks to my wonderful family. I've been told not to name them. Together with my husband Clive, who I will name, who have given me the inspiration to carry on. Thank you to you all. And a final word from the angel. Being an, called an angel sounds like a compliment, but I'm not a good nurse because I have an angelic virtue. I'm a good nurse because I studied hard in nursing school and because I care about my work. Similarly, I did not choose nursing because I had a higher calling to do so. I chose nursing because I love working with and helping other people. Now this statue is dedicated to the community nurses of Brighton and Hove. What better way to end a lecture? Thank you very much for your attention this evening. Thank you.